As for our session today, John's gonna to walk you through some of the reorganization tools that he uses with many of his clients and how you might consider uh, utilizing those in your own business if you ever proceed with a reorg. Steve will then walk you through shareholder agreement and, share and legal ramifications with a reorg. I'll share some uh, tips and tricks regarding two strategies business owner clients tend to use. Um, but throughout the session, if you do have questions, you can just let us know. So without further ado, I'll pass the floor over to Mr. John Robinson. Well, thanks, Brandon. <clears throat> Appreciate that. So today I'm going to take you through uh, the initial steps you should do to prepare for a reorganization, uh, tools to help you decide what course of action might be best, and what advisors you might need helping you uh, at the table at any given time. And at the end, how to save money on a valuation. Could I have the next slide, please? So <clears throat> today I'm going to walk you through why do a reorganization, steps to do, st set this up initially, uh, the central documents registry, and so on. So essentially tax taxes are usually the largest reduction in, in, from year to year and for any transaction that goes on. So to the extent that you can mitigate those or spread them out to uh, other family members through doing a reorganization, it can save you a lot of taxes down the road. Um, restructuring will allow you to pur purify your corporation and achieve your lifetime capital gain exemption, which this year is about $890,000. And if your uh, wife is a shareholder, you may get a double hit on that or other family members. So Steve will speak more on that later. So step one, next slide, please. The collection of how to set up um, a central documents registry. So this is a tool, cloud tool that we've used for many, many years. It's helped uh, facilitate many reorganizations. And the types of things that we're going to seed this with initially are corporate tax returns, uh, financial statements for five years, um, your corporate minute book, your share registry, including all rights and restrictions, personal tax returns, any buy sells or shareholder agreements that you may have, um, <clears throat> your corporate insurance, any property and casualty, any buy sell coverage you may have, and your personal wills. So. How this works is, next slide, please. <clears throat> From our point of view, um, this is essential to setting this up as a sort of a 101 first stage. We get to see everything in the one place at the same time. And frankly, most business owners have not seen or ever seen this level of organization. And they own, by the way, they own this cloud file, it's yours. Uh, you can let other people in, you can share it with other people, you can offer them a login and a password. Uh, we will maintain it for you. Um, we get to identify what's missing, documents that haven't been executed. We've seen shareholder agreements that have been written and never uh, signed, uh, problem areas that may need attention. Um, we're also alerted to conflicts between documents. And uh, Brandon and I are working on a case right now where we can see that the shareholders agreement is in conflict with the uh, two largest shareholders wills. So they're, you know, it's a freight train waiting to go off the tracks. And then lastly, it'll allow you to assess risk management tools that you may wish to use in the future. And Brandon will say more on that later. So from the client's point of view, um, next slide. <clears throat> um, most of them have never had this level of organization. So it's just dependable, secure, uh, cloud file, uh, it saves an immense amount of time uh, dealing with other collaborators. You will be asking other professionals to come on board with you. Um, it's going to reduce the professional fees that you will pay in the future. Um, it'll allow you to do a corporate valuation. It'll allow you to accelerate the value. It may allow you to do bank financing, and it's certainly going to allow you the, the tools to start to discuss a reorganization. So uh, what other advisors uh, like to see? Next slide, please. <clears throat> Basically, this removes one of the biggest uh, problems in working with any file is getting all the information together before you can start. So this removes the paper chase. You're not sending emails to an accountant and a lawyer and a financial planner and so on. Everything's in one place at one time. It's way more efficient. And 
the collaborators uh, who are going to do value enhancement, transaction readiness, and and prepare you for a possible reorganization. Uh, this is going to be monumental to them. It will also allow you to possibly save costs. So when you're not doing a paper chase, that's going to be very valuable to you. So next slide, please. At this point, step two, what other advisors do you need at this point? Uh, you're certainly going to need an experienced exit planner who can facilitate the process and knows how to do value acceleration. Um, you'll also need qualified legals, uh, people who can do transactions like Steve Parr and others. Um, you know, it's interesting right now, I'm looking for a trademark lawyer because I've got an infringement dispute. And uh, the, the practice of law has become so specialized that I've uh, now made four phone calls and not found anybody who's willing to step up to the ring and litigate an infringement issue. So uh, make sure that your lawyer has done corporate restructuring and is familiar with all of the types of documentation. Uh, your current CPA, he may be capable. However, again, they need to be familiar with doing restructuring or have somebody in the firm who's capable of doing freezes, trusts, hold codes, and, and those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> you're going to need a financial advisor in this process because really this is planning for your retirement, how you can get more money out of the company and what risk management tools you uh, need to use. And lastly, if it's a family business, uh, understand a family business is a completely different animal and has a whole different set of rules and parameters when you have other family members involved. Um, Sauter School uh, produces about 30 to 50 a year. And I think there's two others on uh, this call today who uh, went through the Family Enterprise Advisor Program with myself. Um, <clears throat> it's gonna help you uh, resolve disputes, uh, decide if state equalization is necessary, um, all sorts of facets that a family enterprise advisor can uh, offer you. And next slide, please. So, <clears throat> obtaining, um, sorry, I'm gonna go to the next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> Through doing this, your trust advisors working with you are going to show you what's the best way to reorganize your company is, estimate the amount of tax that's due on the uh, transaction, what net income you might need in retirement. And uh, um, I want to move on to a baseline valuation. So this is a specialized piece of evaluation. You're uh, not at this point, you notice I would use the word baseline. Um, you're not at this point applying for bank refinancing. You haven't got a challenge uh, from Revenue Canada or you're in dispute with CRA. You're not in dispute, hopefully, with another shareholder. And you certainly, we hope, you're not having uh, matrimonial reorganizations going on. So there's no need to spend the cost and time to have a formal CBV valuation done at this point. So what you need is a baseline valuation that's going to ascertain the value for your reorganization. Uh, determine how much tax is paid and due on a sale currently. Um, it'll allow you to possibly split income with other family members. It's going to certainly tell you how much will come out the other side to assist in your retirement. And um, at this point, uh, <clears throat> once we've done the valuation, we're going to do a net worth statement for the client without the business value. And that's very important without the business value. Uh, this is often a real eye opener for a lot of clients. Um, we simply take all their assets personally that they hold without the business and see what kind of a retirement cash flow it would generate. And we worked on a file recently where the individual had close to a $10 million net worth personally without the business. And when you start to analyze what's there, they have a property up in uh, the British properties and they've got another summer home on the Gulf Islands and a bunch of flashy toys and uh, uh, a large motorboat and so on. So none of those are going to produce any income. So it's, it's really an eye opener for a lot of these clients. So enable to predict what you're going to need for retirement, then we bring the business value in and see what that looks like. So um, I'm just going to give you a few reasons for evaluation or a, a baseline valuation. Frankly, most business owners don't even know the value of the company. And if you don't know the value, how is it you're possibly going to optimize that? Um, you get a better understanding of your business and its potential and how you can 
uh, magnify the value of your largest asset to plan for your retirement. Um, ensure that the business and your family are properly protected, create a succession plan. Uh, if you're buying a business, it's very useful. Um, it also lets you know what time zone you're in possibly for uh, a sale down the road. You can create a buy, sell or shareholder agreement with it, uh, explore funding opportunities, uh, set up a trust or work on a more detailed estate plan and prepare for one of the largest tax events that you're going to ever have in your life. So um, I want to just go to the next slide, if you would, please. No, previous to that. Next slide, please. Thanks, Brandon. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, so the central documents registry and business valuation are key, but what's also important is with this valuation, we use biz equity that has done 35 million valuations. They're going to take your specific business, um, say it's a metal manufacturing business, and you've got 30 employees and your gross revenues are uh, 12 million a year. Well, they're going to group you with a whole bunch of other like companies and give you KPIs, key performance indicators to tell you uh, what you need to do to accelerate the value of your business. And there's 15 of them, but I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, the KPI is receivables conversion. So this is really important. A lumber company, uh, as an example, receives its money in 24 days <clears throat> um, and its credit terms are 30 days. So when you look at that, it's certainly a positive. Now you're, you're ranked in these each one of these KPIs as underperforming your peers, you're meeting the industry average or you're outperforming the peers and that gives you something then to work at. Um, second example would be uh, inventory turnover. So uh, if a manufacturing company turns its uh, inventory over 5.7 times, it means it's sold it average inventory 5.7 times each year. Well, if you can accelerate that or figure out if you're at the industry average or better or worse, then that's something that you can work on in, uh, immediately. And interest coverage, and the banks love this one. Um, so a company has a ratio of, a software company has a ratio of two times. They suggest they have the ability to meet their interest payments two times over. And um, <clears throat> they can obviously qualify for additional um, financing at this point. So next slide, please. With all these tools, sometimes really all you need is a different perspective to see how you can look at these things and what options and opportunities are available to you. And Steve, um, if I can pass it over to you at this point. Sure, John, thanks very much for that. That was really informative. Um, so before we get started, uh, I understand that we have about 35, 37 individuals on the on the, the call right now. Thanks everybody for showing up. And um, shareholders agreements, corporate reorganizations, does, if, if anybody is actually participating and, and is paying attention to this right now, as opposed to just uh, soaking up the recording afterwards, if you could just pop your questions in the chat, any kind of question that you have about shareholders agreements, about this topic, um, any burning things that, that you've been curious about, um, that would be great. And I'll, I will endeavor to address those questions uh, during the course of my presentation. So uh, feel free to pop that in now or at any point during, uh, uh, if any questions arise while I'm speaking. So, um, so yeah, I'll just jump right into it. So yeah, we're gonna speak about, I'm gonna speak about shareholders agreements and, and corporate organizations. So um, my name is Steve Parr. I, I run a, a small firm called Parr Business Law. Um, in uh in vancouver we and we specialize in business law of course and also we do corporate uh and estate planning so um we do uh, we prepare wills representation agreements power of attorneys and uh and work with with everyday folks and with business owners um to to manage the the succession of, of both their personal assets and uh and their business assets so uh brandon next slide please so a shareholders agreement is you really want to think, I mean, I'm glad that I mentioned estate planning because it's a little bit like a will. Uh, a will is something that that manages what happens um, with the eventuality of your of your death. Uh, and similarly, a shareholders agreement is a plan that's put in place for for eventualities. Um, the reality is, is that every business will eventually die or 
transform it to something else. And um, and oftentimes, just like uh, any number of other relationships, that it can happen at an unexpected moment, um, whether that's because of an unfortunate event, such as an unexpected death or a disability of one of the shareholders who's involved in <clears throat> growing and managing the business, um, or perhaps it's because there was a divorce and uh, one of the shareholders is, is now involved in a, in a divorce proceeding. And so the other remaining shareholders uh, have a desire to protect the business. And so they have uh, put some provisions in place to ensure that the shares don't go to the person um, to, to the ex-spouse of the of the shareholder, uh, or simply because one of the shareholders wants to move on. So say they just want to move on to a different business opportunity. Um, those kinds of things all need to be addressed. And it's far better to think about all of these things uh, well in advance of, uh, of any of these eventualities occurring, because we all know that actually dealing with these things at the moment of where the where the dispute arises um, is is much much more challenging. Uh, there are you know you could you could only imagine the the list of priorities that happens when you know when somebody is is when somebody has died or when somebody is dealing with a disability. Um, it's it's a very stressful time. So uh, so thinking about these things in advance is the best way to protect your business. So you really want to ensure that you take care of this right from the outset. Um, shareholders agreements can be a challenging thing to address. And so it's very important to work with, with a, a skilled corporate lawyer um, and an accountant as well, as well as a financial advisor, because the shareholders agreement actually touches on all three of these things. There are tax implications depending on how your shareholders agreement is structured. And, uh, and there's also usually going to be an insurance component. So um, I'll touch on that in a little bit, but um, yeah, one of, so one of the other key components of a shareholders agreement is that a shareholders agreement will control uh, who can sell the shares and under what conditions. So generally, but not always, there's going to be what's called a right of first refusal. So a right of first refusal will allow the other existing shareholders inside of the company to have a preemptive right to purchase uh, those shares of anybody who decides to to sell their shares. So if the if somebody is selling to a third party, uh, he or she will first have to offer offer their shares to the existing shareholders of the company, give them a right, and depending on how it's structured, you know that right might be offered to the majority shareholders first, you know, like perhaps the the founders of the company, and then um, and then a second or third tier of shareholders. Uh, such as investors or employees or other persons who have come on at a later point. So, so that's that's one way that they can that the ownership structure of the of the company can be controlled. Um, so yeah, when you're when you're also thinking about, um, perhaps I'll just go to the next slide here. Thanks, Brandon. So, um, so yeah, when. I mentioned a financial advisor. So financial advisor is generally going to be somebody who's going to handle your insurance, um, your insurance needs. So life insurance, uh, whether it's a term life or whole life insurance policy and, and the differences on that, I'll, I'll leave the, the, the financial advisors to, uh, to explain. But uh, a life insurance policy is by far the cheapest way to finance a buyout of a shareholder who is departing from your company. So Say you and your partner have started a company 50-50, that person decides to leave um, or you know, some unfortunate event occurs and, and they're, they're no longer with us, then a life insurance policy that is taken out on the, the life of that person um, with the company as the beneficiary will mean that the company will have enough financing, will have the money in, in place in order to fund the, the purchase of that, of that person's shares. So the result is that the company can go on. Uh, the surviving shareholder uh, is not going to be left dealing with the state of the person who has passed, and um, which, which obviously would imperil the the viability of the business going forward. And it'll, um, you know, more importantly, it leaves the estate the uh, with with cash. So uh, it leaves it leaves them with. It effectively allows them to receive the benefit of um of the value of the business um before the the company is actually really ready to sell so 
very, very important to put that in place. Um, the business is generally going to be the most important asset that, uh, that, that any person will develop during the course of their lifetime. So, um, it's essential to, uh, to have liquidity in, in there in the event that something occurs. Um, so another important aspect of a shareholders agreement is that it covers off how important decisions are made. So, um, <clears throat> generally in a, in a private company, the directors are the persons who make the decisions. Um, but in many companies there, those decision-making powers are going to be delegated to, uh, the shareholders to some degree. So shareholders may have a say in, uh, such matters as, you know, whether the company is going to take on more financing, uh, whether top executives are going to be hired or fired, bonused, uh, when and how dividends are going to be paid out, um, and, uh, you know, whether they, they change the line of business. So, like, there's a whole um, number of decisions that shareholders may want to be, have a direct say in, even though they may not hold a director seat as in a seat on the board of the directors of the company. So a shareholders agreement is a way that uh, you can protect minority shareholder interests um, by, by permitting them, by setting out what those, what those, uh, uh, those rights are. So uh, another piece that you want to be thinking about with the shareholders agreement is um, what are called drag along and tag along rights. And you may have heard of these. So I just want to demystify what they are. Um, so a drag along right is, is generally something that's going to be benefiting the majority shareholders. So um, it permits a majority shareholder generally. So somebody, usually it's somebody who holds 50% or more of the shares of the company or a collection of shareholders who, who jointly hold more than 50% to uh, drag along the minority shareholders in a sale. So if say 60% of the shareholders of, of uh, Acme Trading Company decide to sell their interest, then they can drag along the remaining 40% um, because generally a third party buyer is gonna wanna purchase the entire company, uh, not simply the, the 60%. So um, so th that's, a, that's a very important piece to have in, uh, in place. Otherwise, the the minority shareholders could potentially gum up and uh, and, and prevent the the possibility of selling the business. <coughs> um, tag along is similar. Uh, well, it's sort of the inverse. It protects the interests of the minority shareholders. So, if the say the large shareholders decide to sell their piece, uh, the minority shareholders can say, "Hey, what about us? We're coming along for the ride. So we want to join in on the sale, um, and you can't." you majority shareholders cannot conclude this sale unless we are also permitted to sell our shares on the same terms for the same price. So the third party, the external buyer is required to buy all the shares uh, of the, 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 the selling shareholders plus the, um, the smaller shareholders who have elected to, to act on the tag along, right? So um, let's go to the next slide, please, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. So, um, so that's that's an important piece. And um, <coughs> the forgive me, I got a little bit of a cold. So uh, the exit strategy. So yeah, this is this is uh, the, these are sort of the circumstances that we're going to look at where you know we're not talking about necessarily um, death or disability, but uh, but simply where where one of the shareholders wishes to sell, so or say buy out the other partner. So you you may have heard of the shotgun clause. Uh, the infamous shotgun clause. So this is a, a blunt instrument, but it's also can be a very useful um, instrument. And it how how the shotgun mechanism works is that one of the shareholders can propose to another shareholder, hey, I want to buy your shares out for a dollar a share. So say the other shareholder holds a hundred thousand shares. So I give you a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to buy your shares, and then the other shareholder can either accept that. Uh, usually within a certain time frame, so, um, say 15 to 30 days, um, or or flip it on that shareholder and say, you know what, I'm going to reject your offer and instead purchase your shares for $100,000. So, um, and one of the two must accept this offer. So, this is this can be very useful because it can resolve a deadlock. So, say where two or more shareholders are unable to continue to work together, perhaps because of some personal disagreement or a different vision about where the direction of the company is going, uh, they can exercise this right and that way they can they can force a sale. 
Um, the difficulty with this is generally for the party that has that doesn't have is, is not as well financed or is not able to access the same type of financing um, because they can simply be priced out. You know, like the the a shareholder could just propose a price that the other party is un, unable to match, um, and this kind of dynamic is particularly pronounced in situations where there is, uh, say, a majority shareholder who holds 80% and then a minority that holds only 20%, um, it would be obviously much, much more expensive for the 20% shareholder to buy out the 80% shareholder than than, it, <laughs> than the inverse. Um, so baking in a valuation mechanism. So yeah, obviously this begs the question, how do we value the shares? So. Uh, if there is not a mechanism inside of the, the shareholders agreement, then uh, then generally it's just a price that's agreed upon between the parties and they they, they may not agree upon that. Um, so uh, this can be done in a variety of different ways. Generally, how I've seen it done and how, how I do it in my agreements is that we will you know, first, the first course of action is just simply the board of directors agree upon um agree upon evaluation of the of the shares and if that can't be agreed upon then go to the company's accountants and if that if if that's if that's not agreed upon by all the parties uh then at that point you might want to be looking at uh getting a, a third party certified business valuator which can be significantly more expensive so um the accountants the accountants appraisal because it's not a formal certified business valuation is going to be less expensive um, provided that your accountant is willing to, to do that. Uh, and uh, whereas a certified business valuator is generally, it's going to be at least $5,000 um, to, to get a valuation. So, and even then, you know, there may not be uh, a consensus on what that valuation is. So um, some dispute resolution mechanisms will need to be addressed there. So referring the, the, referring the matter out to arbitration to be uh, decided upon by uh, by an arbitrator under the Arbitration Act of BC. Okay, so uh, let's just go to the next slide. Um, I don't know if I'm covering too much or too little. It's always hard to say with these Zoom presentations because it's kind of like speaking into uh, speaking into a bit of a vacuum, but uh, but that's all good. So um, the so another piece that I want to cover off is that. Uh, a shareholders agreement is going to be it's going to be put in place in any circumstance should be put in place in any circumstance where the company has significant value uh and where it's going to be uh, you know a going concern for for years to come and where there's obviously more than one shareholder um and so i'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about corporate restructuring or share restructuring so a share restructure is almost always done part as part of a as, as part of reorg work. So um, the multiplication of lifetime capital gains that can occur when a family trust is incorporated. So I uh, generally the structure, how it looks is, and, uh, and forgive me that I didn't prepare a slide to demonstrate this. So just follow along in your mind. You can see like the, the family trust will generally own the shares of the operating company. So the operating company, um, say Acme, you know, Acme Enterprises Inc. is going to be owned by the family trust. And, and then the family trust will uh, have a variety of beneficiaries. So the beneficiaries could be a holding company or multiple different holding companies or individual, individual family members. Uh, uh, the purpose of this is that it is going to, uh, it's a number of things. For one, this can be done as part of what's called an estate freeze. So um, this is a, a method where the existing shares of the operating company, um, which are, are called common shares and hold the, hold the value of the company can be exchanged for preferred shares of the company. So to illustrate, so say like Acme holding Acme enterprises Inc is held by one entrepreneur. Uh, they've, they've grown that business to be worth about $10 million. Um, but then they want to they they want to hand over control to the next generation to their say their son and their daughter, um, but they don't they don't necessarily want to sell it to them because a they would you know the son and the daughter don't have the money to to buy the the ten million dollar to buy the ten million dollars of assets, um, 
So what they can, what the entrepreneur can do is exchange those common shares for what are called preferred shares. So it's done under something called section 86 of the income tax act. And the, so the shares are now preferred shares that the uh, entrepreneur will hold. And the, whereas the common shares, there's no longer any common shares. And so that the company is effectively, it's the common shares are worth nothing. Like they're, they're zeroed out because all of the, all of the value of the company has been crystallized <coughs> inside of those preferred shares. Um, and so the common shares are subscribed for by, uh, by the family trust. And then, and then the family trust, um, and, th and then the family trust will, uh, list the, the different beneficiaries to, um, to receive future proceeds of the, of the operating company. So the operating company has future earnings. Those get flowed up to the family trust and then get distributed out to the beneficiaries. Um, so importantly, what this what this really can achieve is the multiplication of the lifetime capital gains exemption. So for any business that's worth more than a million dollars, this can be very, very helpful um, because the, the lifetime capital gains is $900,000. And so if you can multiply that with multiple family members, then you can potentially have three or four more than that million dollars worth of lifetime capital gains exemption available as part of the sale. Um, there's far more than I can cover in this uh, in this short presentation. So we'll just go to the next slide at this point. Thanks, Brennan. Um, and actually, I'm gonna. What are the quick advantages of a family trust? Okay, so um, I think we're. I think I'm gonna skip this piece about the use of the prescribed rate loan strategy because we've kind of been talking at a at a fire hose sort of pace here, and there's just there's frankly there's just too much. To, to cover off here and uh, and I know that Brandon wants to to get his uh, to, to speak to his present part of the presentation as well so um, Larry I'll just briefly address your question so the quick advantages of family trust are a the, the multiplication of the lifetime capital gains exemption uh, B it permits the it, it permits the the entrepreneur to retain control of the company um, while because they are a trustee of the family trust so they can they can control the flow of the distribution of the profits to the beneficiaries. So the um, they don't necessarily have to turn over the reins right away. Um, and uh, and there are a couple of other uh, benefits that I I just don't have the scope right now to to cover off. But I do, Larry. I'll reach out to you directly, and I do have uh, some more information that I can share with you. So, um, Brandon, let's let's move on to the next slide. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean that that is one of the the quick benefits is that it does reduce uh, liability in the operating company um, because yeah you can flow the cash out of the operating company into the trust and then through that into the holding company. So it's important to always keep cash out of the operating company um, from uh, from the perspective of, uh, of of both reducing liability but also in terms of what's called the qualified small business shares. So you want to make sure that your shares are qualified small business shares um, so that they can qualify for the um, uh, so that they can so that they can qualify for the lifetime capital gains exemption. Um, there are very particular requirements to to be eligible for shares to be eligible for the lifetime capital gains exemption. And one of them is that there is not more than 90% um, or sorry, that at least 90% of the assets inside of the operating company are actively used in the company. So that means if there's surplus cash in there, that's no good. That's no bueno. The money's got to get out of there. It's got to be um, either put into a holding company or or into a family trust. Um, and there are, there are some difficulties with flowing that money out into a holding company, which is why the use of a family trust can be preferable um, if if the entrepreneur is seeking to make use of the lifetime capital gains exception. So um, let's just go to the next, uh, I, I think that's it, right? Yeah, so I'll just pass it over to Brandon here. And just by way of conclusion, there's a lot to cover here and uh, and I'd be happy to discuss any of these points in more detail. Um, so just please feel free to reach out. Thanks, Brandon, over to you. Thanks, Steve, uh, greatly appreciate it. And uh, that's why we all need lawyers. Yeah. 
uh, backing us up so we uh, can realize uh, all the complexity that can come up with having multiple legal structures associated with our business. So uh, switching gears a bit, I'm going to talk about some creative wealth strategies for building wealth that um, some business owners haven't heard of that I've come across. Uh, and if you have heard about them, perhaps this will illuminate some of the details uh, that, that could help you decide if these are strategies relevant for you. Now, first off, before we get into the strategies, let's just quickly review that the uh, corporate tax rate in BC is 12%. Now, this is, of course, for active business income less than 500000 Now, if we're looking at the top marginal tax rate in BC, that's 53%. So there's a massive difference between what your business is going to pay on active business income and how much you're going to pay to flow money out for, uh, to either your um, yourself or potentially your spouse if you're both receiving income from your uh, corporation. I did see a question come in from someone anonymous, and we'll get to that right after uh, these points. So the individual pension plan, uh, what is it? Who's the ideal candidate? The individual pension plan operates similar to an RRSP, but it's uh, defined as a pension under the federal legislation. Incorporated business owners between the ages of 40 and 60 may be interested in using an IPP, uh, but these are business owners that consistently are pulling out over 150K from their business, um, ideally T4 income, because they'll be getting the RRSP contribution room, and they should have a relationship of about 10 years with the business. Why would a business owner care about using an IPP versus just a traditional RRSP? There's a number of tax benefits associated with setting these programs up that make it advantageous for business owners to evaluate using the IPP over the RRSP. In fact, uh, many business owners, if planned appropriately, could end up with 20 to 30% more contribution room than the traditional 18% available to the business owner. IPPs also have better, better creditor proofing, uh, as well as several tax deductible events that aren't available to traditional RRSPs. Uh, they, this, uh, this slide is courtesy of our friends over at West Coast Actuaries, who uh, we leverage for many of these programs when we set, uh, set them up for our clients. Corporations will contribute directly to IPPs versus the individual contributing directly to an RRSP. This strategy is best used for successful business owners only because there obviously is cost associated with setting these programs up. When clients approach us about evaluating IPPs, where we typically tell them to plan six to 12 months in advance before they actually do it. And the reason for that is actuarial calculations will need to be run by our, our friends over at West Coast. And we'll also need to do some advanced tax planning with your accountant. Uh, and IPPs, they're not a one size fits all strategy, but if you look at uh, these graphs, you'll see that the contribution amounts between the ages of 40 and 60 uh, are certainly quite a bit higher than if you were only contributing to an RRSP. And so it's definitely worth evaluating as you look to diversify your retirement nest egg. <clears throat> now, looking at the insured deposit funds, I'll, I'll bring it first off uh, to taxes again. From 2019 to today, we're seeing tax rates increase across all lines, whether that's your regular income, whether it's your passive investments within your corporation or capital gains. Now, what happens if Justin Trudeau decides to increase the capital gains uh, tax to 75%, that's just going to further uh, impact your ability to build and retain more of the wealth that you're building. <clears throat> so uh, for the insured deposit fund strategy, I first just want to look at if you just invest within your corporation passively. And I come across this among business owners very often. And the, they, the reasons they tell me are, well, I don't want to have to pay my high personal tax rate. So I'd rather just invest in my corporation. Uh, okay, no problem, but you're going to be consistently paying more tax within your corporation and potentially putting your small business deduction limit at risk. So if this is a business owner that was putting about $30,000 a year into their investments within their corporation, they're going to be paying annual tax on income. That income would eventually need to be flowed out and tax would need to be paid again. As well, you know, there may be some flexibility or liquidity with that non-registered investment. So if it's short term and the business owner might need the money, I can understand why they would want to perhaps invest in a non-registered account within the corp. However, when they look to liquidate those funds and flow them out personally, they will need to pay any capital gains as well as personal tax rates, whether they choose to take it out as a T4 or a dividend. So you'll see three, uh, 30K over 25 years, there's a significant amount of that money paid to taxes uh, and the business owner is actually end up, uh, doesn't end up with, with, with much. Now, the insured deposit fund is essentially a permanent insurance vehicle 
that's held by a corporation. Oftentimes it's the holding company versus the operating company. The growth of these particular investment vehicles can grow tax-free within the corporation. And you may say, okay, well, why would I do that? Well, in addition to not paying tax on a regular basis, you also are building up an asset that you can borrow against through the form of a collateral or policy loan. It is possible to withdraw the cash and cancel the plans, but there is uh, some negative tax implications associated with that. So it's generally not recommended. The other advantage specifically for business owners that are wanting to pass on assets to family is that the death benefits from these policies can be paid out tax-free. So you're essentially taking corporate dollars out of your business and flowing it through to your family, utilizing the capital dividend account. There will still be some tax associated depending on the ACB or adjusted cost basis of the policy, but ultimately you'll see that the business owner ends up with substantially more money by utilizing an insured deposit fund versus just saving and investing through non-registered accounts in the corporation. <clears throat> so whenever we're working with clients, oftentimes we're just gathering facts about their situation and then understanding what they care about and what they need. So as an example, if a business owner had a massive capital gain down the road, let's just say $8.4 million, we would look and say, okay, well, which type of policies would make the most sense? Uh, we, we will look at all the carriers in the marketplace and we'd find the best universal life, the best whole life and run some comparisons. So as an example here, if uh, this was a, a 55 year old business business owner, this business owner could put uh, 116,000 into a universally funded, minim, minimally funded UL, 197 into a whole life plan or an accelerated whole life plan where they're only contributing for 10 years. What does that uh, mean at the end? Well, you'll see that the uh, whole life will allow the cash value to build. Cash value is what you can access while you're alive and the death benefit will grow. Now, the cheapest option, of course, you'll see that the death benefit doesn't end up growing. Uh, but at the end of the day, our role as advisors is to understand what matters to you, find out what solutions make the most sense for your situation and run the numbers with your accountant to ultimately help you make the best possible decision. Uh, so that was just a brief overview of IPPs and insured deposit funds. Uh, we'll now open the floor up to questions. <clears throat> Our first question has come in from someone anonymous. They've said, any suggestions to minimize the tax hit when both uh, spouses own shares? And I'll invite uh, John and Steve to, to join for this as well. So for one of the strategies I spoke about, uh, a way that a business owner may leverage the fact that the spouse is also a shareholder would be to buy a joint and last to die policy, which would drive down the cost basis of the policy and ultimately allow you to put more money into the cash value and less money into the cost of the insurance. But John or Steve, I don't know if you've got anything else you'd like to add to that. Sure. Well, I'll just jump in a little bit about, so um, maybe familiar with the TOSI rules that uh, that came into effect in 2017. So that's tax on split income. So it, originally it used to be much easier to um, to insert family family shareholders with its spouse and children into the corporate structure and then to flow out income to them, taking advantage of a lower marginal income tax rate that, that different family members might have. Uh, the TOSI rules um, have made that much more difficult to achieve, but there are still some limited opportunities for income splitting um, in particular cases. Like it needs to be worked through with, with a, a, good, a good accountant and a good lawyer. Um, but basically the essence of it is that the people, the persons that are receiving income need to be working in the business to some extent. So there needs to be some uh, contribution to the business for for those share for those both spouses and potentially their children to um, receive some of that income and have it have it be taxed at the marginal rate. Um, so that's that's one way that uh, to minimize the tax hit. Uh, the other way might be uh, to uh, if you're a qualified small business corporation and you do qualify for a, a freeze, um, you may be able to uh, achieve two tax-free capital gain exemptions, lifetime capital gain exemptions on your small business. So that, that may be a possibility. Yep. Thanks, John. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we get another one that's come in from, from Larry. What happens to my PP upon death? Does my spouse get taxed when she receives it? Uh, John, fire away, my friend. <laughs> Well, having had an IPP myself for over 20 years, um, 
it's simple. It's the same as an RSP. You designate a beneficiary and it flows through to them. And then they can do with it as they see fit. There's no selling of investments. It's just in-kind transfer to your beneficiary. And I would point out one other thing that I don't came out clearly on the West Coast slide was that uh, all expenses in an IPP from year to year are deductible. If you've got some actuarial costs from time to time, if you um, have some investment management fees from your uh, advisor, those are tax deductible. So you can basically deduct and expense all of those fees where you're not able to do that with uh, our RSP plans. So, Thanks, thank John. You. I had a question come in privately. Uh, what, what effect has COVID had on business valuations? Um, and John, I don't know if you've uh, seen much of that in your last few years, last couple of years. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting, but uh, when COVID started back in 2020, uh, the M&A market basically fell off the cliff and uh, uh, business transactions were, were just about down by 60%. However, if you ask an M&A advisor today what's going on, I think they've made up uh, well for the, the loss back in 2020. So um, the problem with COVID is it's affected so many businesses so differently that it is uh, difficult doing a valuation when you've got uncertain cash flows, both now and in the future. And so whatever financial modeling that you do is, is uh, suspect. So, I mean, you've got all sorts of government measures, SEBA, uh, uh, CREB, CERBA, you know, wage, wage replacement benefits, and on and on and on. Um, you know, the current market situation and the uncertainty of the cash flow is certainly in some businesses going to adjust their value downwards or, or it's going to be made dependent upon that. Um, you know, in these exceptional times, um, it depends on the sector that you're looking at. I mean, I would say that tourism hotels, fitness, airlines, food and beverage uh, have all taken it on the chin fairly hard. And yet there's other industries like the uh, lumber broker industry and the lumber production industry that uh, is having a gangbuster year. So uh, it's a sector dependent, I think would be more accurate to, to answer the question. And, um, you know, the problem in doing valuations now with these uncertain cash flows is there's probably more questions than answers. So it, uh, becomes a bit of a suspect situation unless you can really justify your plans for future cash flow. So I hope that answers your question. Certainly. Yeah. And I'll speak from the tech business owner side. Money has been so cheap. The venture capital money has been flowing. So even if you have some small trajectory of growth uh, for a SaaS business, you were seeing intensely high valuations. So uh, yeah, it's definitely a uh, uh, K-shaped recovery depending on the industry that you happen to be in. Well, the other thing is, uh, you know, supply chain problems. And you know, I walked around the seawall the other day and I was shocked to see 22 ships in English Bay. Uh, and yet uh, I have two friends that are doing renovations in their houses that are both six months overdue because they can't get the parts or whatever the story is uh, that they need. So supply chain problems are certainly uh, relevant to valuations and so on. Agreed. Uh, John, there was a, uh, sorry, Steve, there was, you mentioned qualifying for a freeze. What situations can cause a business uh, not to qualify? Um, not to qualify for a freeze. I, I think uh, what I was referring to was not qualifying for the lifetime capital gains exemption. So yeah, situations. So basically to, for the shares in a private corporation to qualify uh, upon their sale for the lifetime capital gains exemption, there are a few things that need to be in place. Uh, the first of which is that the shares need to be in a what's called a, a CCPC or a Canadian controlled private corporation. So the, what that means is that at least 50% of the shareholders uh, or the control of the company is Canadian. Um, so generally, you know, as long as the most of the shareholders, most of the directors are Canadian, you're usually going to qualify for that. Uh, the second piece is that the shares 90% of the assets inside of the operating company need to be actively used in the business. So um, there does you can't have a big pile of cash sitting in your operating company. Otherwise, you're going to be offside of that. So those are the two main factors. Um, and finally, the, the shares need to be held by the shareholder who wishes to qualify for the lifetime capital gains exemption for at least two years. So, um, yeah, I just want to emphasize that point because I have seen this many times uh, with clients where, unfortunately, they're not able to avail themselves of the 
of the capital gain exemption because one of these three things. And so this is why it's very important to think with the end in mind. Um, if you are thinking, of, if you are in the type of business where you do foresee that a, a sale might be possible, start early. Just really start early and get your ducks in a row on the accounting and, and legal side to, to make sure that you can. Um, and, uh, and particularly if you wanna take advantage of multiplying that, that capital gain exemption, then, uh, then definitely time to, the time is now to, to get ahead of that, so yeah. Steve and John, you had spoken about the differences between say a family business and a operating business, depending on necessarily who's going to be uh, next in line to take on the business. What are perhaps some uh, errors that you've seen in the past or some lack of planning that has led to problems that uh, you might be able to share? You know, it's a uh, family business is a complete unique business unto its own because of the family dynamics. And quite often you've got uh, only part of the uh, children involved in the business. Then you may be discussing estate equalization issues that Brandon, you know, uh, you know that insurance can take care of that. Um, <clears throat> you know, are, are, are the children able and capable of taking it on? What training do they have? Are they going to run it into the ground and uh, take dad's uh, retirement plan with with it? You know, and so and and quite often there are spicy conversations. You may need a facilitator uh, to be brought in to uh, have these conversations that you might not normally get in a, a Bill and Sam owning a company when there is family relations involved. So that's just the tip of the iceberg, but uh, it's quite a long list of issues that family businesses encounter that others don't. I'm curious, both of your perspective on this, but what, why do you find that uh, business owners don't have their ducks in a row generally? Well, I'm all the way in on that. Uh, you know, uh, business owners are unique. They, a lot of them just don't want to plan, no matter how much you suggest to them or show them there's a better way or they can get these exemptions or split income. Um, a lot of times they, they would just rather do what they've done for the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, the old saw, if your identity is what you've done for the last two or three decades, who are you when you don't do it anymore? And I think additionally, you know, a lot of these business owners don't have a plan of what kind of a significant retirement they're going to have. I mean, what's, what, what are they going to do that gives them juice? You know, they tell you, oh, yeah, gardening, uh, grandchildren, and golf, you yeah, call it a three Gs. That's going to wear thin really quick. So <clears throat> you need to have a significant plan of what you're going to do in retirement. You need to have an organizational plan of how you're going to do that. And you need a financial plan to figure out what, you, what your business is going to produce for you in the future. And, you know, there's the anomalies where businesses are, aren't worth that much, but they're kicking out a huge salary for the owner. And frankly, he'd just rather go in and make widgets every day until he, he they take him out with his boots on. So <clears throat> there's a very long answer to that question, Brandon. We don't have time for it today. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'll, th there's so many things to say about that, of course. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, my two cents on that is simply that it, it is complex and it does require long-term thinking. And, um, you, you know, we're all business owners ourselves here. And so, you know, I can totally emphasize with, empathize with the position that entrepreneurs are in. There's often a lot of fires, immediate fires to put out, you know, client work to do, um, managing of your team, all of that stuff. And, uh, and finding the extra time to think about the long-term horizon can be, can be challenging. So, um, so that piece, and then the second piece is it's complex, you know, and the Income Tax Act is changing all the time. Uh, the types of, um, of products and services that, that might help a business owner over the long haul, they're going to be varied and you just need to have good people around you. So having people that you can trust that, that really are up to speed on everything um, and, and sort of do this day in and day out is really important to have. And, and having a team of them, you know, it, because it's, it's going to take more than one advisor to, to get a business owner off um, to the finish line. Great, great point, Steve. Um, and I think that comes to the kind of cohesiveness of a, of a team as well. So, you know, if you've got your buddy who's an accountant and he's great, that's awesome. But you need to make sure you've got the connected lawyer, the connected financial planner, all of whom talk, who understand each other and are proficient in, in what they do. 
Uh, so yeah, I, this conversation is great because I get to hear from people that know things that I don't. And I, I'm the first to say if I don't understand something. Uh, and I think your advisors should be doing that as well. Uh, nobody knows everything. Uh, and if they don't, they should be going and getting the information and bringing it back. And that is what separates, uh, I would say, an average advisor from an exceptional one is one that has a team and one that can say when they don't know something and come back with the right information. Uh, we still have over 30 folks on the call, so I, I do welcome any of you if you have questions uh, or if we haven't covered something you thought we would today, uh, please do. I know we didn't specifically say how to uh, divorce proof your company, but uh, perhaps if uh, Steve or John would like to share some, uh, some thoughts on that, that might be a, a good conversation because I, I do get some responses from clients on, on that particular point. Steve, why don't you take it? Sure. I, well, in, I alluded to this a little bit in the shareholders agreement, um, just in the sense that uh, that often what share, what shareholders would do in that agreement is set it up so that if one of them gets divorced, um, then automatically the shares of the person of that person are are purchased by uh, by the company. So I don't know if that's exactly what you had in mind with that. I mean, that's certainly that is proofing the company, that's protecting the company from divorce, from the impact of, of divorce, but it's not, of course, protecting the, uh, the shareholder who's getting divorced. <laughs> so, although it does provide them with a, with a buy it with funds, because of course they're, they are gonna get paid um, some amount from the company for their shares. And uh, we have had other clients who put the shares in a discretionary family trust, and there's some thought processes that that uh, can potentially uh, protect the company from uh, matrimonial reorganizations down the road. Fantastic. Well, um, we are coming to the top of the hour. So I just would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Steve and John for, for joining today and sharing your expertise. Uh, and also thank you to all of you uh, attendees for joining today. Uh, as business owners, I know you're busy. So to, to block off an hour and listen to, to this, I hope you've got some value from, from the session. Uh, and as I did mention earlier, please do share your feedback and please feel free to register for any of our other upcoming webinars. Um, and yeah, any final uh, parting comments, John or Steve? Be well, plan well, get moving. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Pleasure speaking with you today, this morning. Yeah. Thanks for organizing this, Brandon. My pleasure. Everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Take care.